Hi everyone, welcome to the session of our web series, Fireside Chat with Champions, in which we interview global business leaders, asking them crowdsource question relevant to the biggest challenge we face today, COVID-19 and its impact on various aspects of business and society, and the way we can steer ourselves in current uncertainties. Today we have a very special guest with us, Seta Tutunjia, Director of Programs, International Center for Bioceline Agriculture, or ICBA. ICPA promotes agriculture resilience, food security and nutrition, sustainable livelihoods and jobs in marginal environments by focusing on alternative solutions. SETA oversees three key areas for ICPA, sustainable natural resource management, crop diversification and genetics, and partnership and resource mobilization. SETA is a champion who has worked extensively in the water, environment, energy, and agriculture sectors, and is a recipient of several awards including but not limited to the prestigious Superior Honor Award by the Government of the United States of America in 2012. She is a visionary and has led the formulation and implementation of several complex multi transformational change programs that promote a greener and more sustainable economy and culture for all of us. Programs led by SETA are used as case studies globally for international development, example being the water efficiency and public information for action project, which is used as a case study by Center of International Development, the Harvard University, and is presented in three marketing handbooks by Philip Kotler and Nancy Lee. Thanks, Seta, for accepting our invitation. I would request you to let our viewers know a bit more about you and your current interests and activities. Floor is yours, Seta. Thank you, Deepak. It was my pleasure to be with you today uh, in, in this uh, exchange of ideas about what is going on. Uh, my interests are uh, sustainable development and uh, particularly looking at how we can uh, use water more efficiently and effectively in our daily lives, uh, both for our sanitary needs, but also for agriculture and producing our food. And the past uh, 25 years, I've worked in the water sector in different industries, and for the past eight years, more specifically on the agricultural sector. And most of my work is, has been in countries which suffer from water scarcity, and that uh, on a daily basis, we are faced with how can we live a uh, sustainable living with good living standards, uh, with this uh, curtail to development, which is water, uh, mainly. That's awesome. Uh, 25 years for one cause. That's what we always say that once you find your passion, you always do wonders. So thanks, Seta, for uh, this. And this brings us for you to ask the first question. Uh, the common trend we have seen across the globe today, post-COVID, and, and while we are working through the COVID challenge, is that uh, across the globe, there is a restriction on transportation and movement of people, leading to logistical challenges. We are seeing slowing of delivery of agriculture input services to farmers and preventing farmers, especially the smallholders, getting their product to the market, leading to great losses of produce as well as income. What impact do you see on the food and agriculture ecosystem due to COVID-19 and subsequent economic downturn, including its impact on the way we produce and consume food? So as you said, uh, the, uh, the current lockdown is uh, basically that started with China uh, around five months or four months now has really uh, impacted the way that we do business. We've seen different countries adopt different measures of this uh, from partial to full closure of public outlets of businesses. And there's a greater re uh, reliance on virtual work which could work in some work situations in some businesses. But as you know, for farming, we have to go to the field. So now if we talk about a food system, food system consists of both the production side and the consumption side. And if we look at the COVID-19 situation, it affects, affects both. It affects the production side in terms, as you mentioned, the restriction of movements. And this impacts first farmers' ability to go and work on their own fields, particularly if the field is not adjacent to the house, but also how do they obtain labor? And this in turn impacts field work from irrigation to harvesting. 
And then uh, we, we've we read, for instance, uh, last month's articles about farmers in Italy who have not been able to go harvest the crops on the, uh, that are already available for harvest. And I believe that particularly uh, hit our high intensity farms, those farms that are large uh, in with intensive input that have not been mechanized and uh, more particularly uh, livestock and meat and dairy producing facilities where there's a high density of animals, there's a high density of workers, which makes it very difficult to control outbreak. And this has even more greatly affected the meat and dairy industry. Uh, so if we look also on the other side, which is uh, the impact on logistics and supply chains. Uh, so in our daily lives, we've noticed the restriction on our travel, but with these restrictions on travel, of course, it's also restricting, uh, to a certain extent, the movement of food goods. And this is all on the production side. And of course, with the restrictions on the movement of food and of the supply chain and logistics, uh, food are perishable products. So we might see a higher degree of food loss and within the uh, value chain. Already we are suffering, uh, or we were suffering in the past from high food loss. But this may increase in, uh, with the current situation, and we need to find uh, ways and means to reduce it. Now we move to the co uh, consumption side, which is the other uh, equation side. And the outbreak control measures have, as we all know, uh, see, we've seen a decline in the economy. Uh, so uh, COVID-19 basically has developed from a global food health crisis, from a global health crisis, to possibly one of the most severe economic crises, at least since the Great Depression in 1929. So uh, we've, we've heard of, uh, we're increasingly hearing, and I hope we, we manage to find a solution out of it, but we're increasingly hearing of bankruptcies, of closure of small businesses, of uh, loss of jobs. Of course, this, all of this is affecting uh, the purchasing power of consumers. And here there's also a disparity between uh, high income countries and uh, middle and low income countries. We're hearing of stimulus packages and bailouts that are being negotiated and approved by high income countries to stimulate their economies. But what would be the case in middle and low income countries, which are already struggling with uh, reducing uh, poverty levels? with eliminating hunger, with uh, increasing their water and energy uh, connectivity to their poor uh, people. So already, would they be able to afford similar stimulus package to, uh, to help their economies overcome uh, the crisis at hand? Uh, these are all things that we would have to wait and see. But uh, at the bottom line would be that there would be an impact on the purchasing power of consumers. If we look at uh, the past, uh, the increase in living standards and uh, in emerging economies have greatly impacted their food choices. So we probably would see a similar impact on food choices of consumers as they lose their purchasing uh, power. Of course, uh, these changes will differ from country to country. It will depend on local conditions. Uh, and we would have to wait and see uh, on how things will develop in the coming weeks and months. Very well articulated, uh, Seta, very well articulated. You gave a very uh, 360 degree perspective of uh, both on consuming as well as production side. So thanks for that. Uh, Seta, we have seen that a lot of countries they have started restricting the export of food commodities. While for cereals and grains, we won't be seeing that much of challenge because the world was having plenty of it. But at the same time, you see that for perishable, including food, fruits and vegetable, uh, the supply chain is, was so fragile that it is actually broken. So within the countries, which are large countries, when we talk about example like India, and those countries which import a lot of these perishable, typically when we talk about the GCC country nations, and some part of Europe. How do you see the food security challenges panning out globally, especially those who are importing food, uh, for example, MENA region? And also I would like to understand a little bit the ICBS perspective that what activities you are doing uh, for long-term uh, solving the challenge of food security, 
because you have been doing beautiful work in field of uh, creating the right sort of crop for uh, uh, arid and uh, marginal environments. So we would like to understand, and you have been doing it before the COVID. So that's that's a great part of it. Uh, so we would like to understand your perspective on the food security issue and the work of ICFA for that. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's quite a big question, uh, Deepak. So uh, let me start by saying that the the current case is unprecedented in modern history, and uh, what makes it even more challenging is the globalization. The globalization that we're currently experiencing has not been experienced before. Of course, that was brought about uh, because of the need to build on each other's uh, strength. So uh, we cannot all, all, all now throw stones at globalization because it does have its benefits as well. But in a situation like this, it actually highlights the uh, downsides of uh, globalization. So there are many uncertainties. And what we would discuss now is mostly reasoning and speculations and looking at how did we deal with past events that might not be identical, but might be similar. And based on that, we can extrapolate what could be some of the implications. So having said that, we look at food securities. Uh, it has four main pillars for food security. The first pillar is availability of food. And that is that there is a reliable and consistent source of quality food that is available to consume. The second pillar is accessibility, which means people have sufficient resources to produce and or purchase the food that they require. So this is a departure from, at least it was a departure from the previous uh, food security aspect that we have to produce food, so that we can produce food or we can purchase it for those countries that truly cannot produce it. Uh, sustainably or orderly. The third pillar to food security is utilization, is do people have the knowledge and enough basic sanitary conditions, and that's really important because you have around 1.1 billion people who don't have access to clean water, to prepare and distribute food in a way that results in a good nutrition. And the last component or pillar of food security, which is stability, which is people's ability to access and utilize food that remains stable over extended periods of time. So if we look at the current situation with the, uh, with the challenges on supply chains and logistics, that directly affects the first component, which is ability, uh, the availability. And it affects it more for countries that are high importers of food. Now, if we look at the economic uh, situation and what is expected to develop even further in the coming weeks and months, then those would have a direct effect also on accessibility. How much can people continue to be able to afford to produce or to purchase food? Not only at uh, government level, but also at individual level. And then the stability, which is over extended periods of time, because some may have savings, so that would take them for a certain period of time. And this is where the stimulus uh, packages of governments are important. But then that, that is mainly you have a direct impact on the three pillars of food security. And that leaves us with the fourth pillar, which is utilization. If we look at how much utilization also is tied to availability of water and sanitary services, with the current economic situation and with the health risks posed and the economic challenges posed, how much would the current programs that have been uh, established and were planned for the next decade in increasing uh, water availability and sanitation services to the poor be able to continue and that also would have impact on the fourth pillar of food security. So of course you, uh, you, you asked about the MENA region. Uh, the MENA region is not a homogeneous uh, region. It has different countries with different uh, national be able to see more diversification diversification of agricultural products, uh, diversification in terms of returning to some of our native and national foods and species, and diversification of uh, livestock. And uh, you know, this is a, a dear subject to my heart when we talk that over the past uh, now 40 years, we have seen a globalization of our diet 
whereby currently more than 60% of our calorie intake on a global scale comes from three crops, which are uh, rice, uh, maize, and uh, wheat. And this has come with the rise of uh, monoculture, of high intensive systems. And with that, we have seen a decline in native uh, crops, and, and some of which are very nutritious, from sorghum to millet, to uh, quinoa, to other underutilized crops. So I would expect to see, hopefully, in the future, more diversification. This is on the plant side, but also on the animal side, with a, a departure from the current monoculture and uniform systems. Um, what did you ask me? You also asked me about how, how the work that we do at ICBA can tackle uh, issues related to agriculture and food security. So uh, ICBA's work, we have focused, we were established in uh, 1996 by uh, the visionary uh, leadership of the UAE government and Islamic Development Plan, which wanted to find mechanisms and means to increase agricultural productivity in areas that are being uh, hit at the time by salinity but also by marginal conditions in terms that we're talking biophysical marginality of poor soil conditions, limited water resources, uh, harsh climate conditions in terms of heat, uh, socioeconomic marginality in terms of they are isolated regions, dispersed regions. So if we look at the current, uh, at, at these countries, we would notice that most of these countries and regions they are highly food importing countries. So our work during the last 20 years has been focused on how can we increase agricultural productivity in such regions. And we've done that by looking at these underutilized crops and native species. We've looked at how can we utilize different water resources other than fresh resources in terms of brackish water, even seawater, treated wastewater, how can we re rehabilitate degraded soil uh, to make it more productive? And all of this would be uh, more and more of use, I think, in the coming uh, months and years as countries would look at how they can increase their uh, food security by uh, diversifying in terms of diversifying, uh, having an increase in local production and uh, together with the import. And I can give you a few examples. For instance, some of the crops that we've been working on is, is quinoa. Quinoa is not only a very nutritious crop or a food, uh, what you call it, superfood crop, but it also is a crop that requires, it's a drought resistant crop meaning that its water requirements are about half of the requirements of any of the other uh, staple crops in terms of crops or maize. So that means that with the uh, amount of water that you will have to irrigate uh, one hectare of, for instance, maize, you can irrigate two hectares of quinoa and get maximum production. Uh, other crops that we've worked on are salicornia, for instance. Salicornia is a very versatile crop that you can use for uh, feed for us humans, but also for animal feed. And it's a crop that you can irrigate with seawater. So if you have uh, uh, a scarce food, fresh water availability, you have another option of being able to produce with seawater. Uh, we've looked at different soil amendments. How can we uh, add additives to the soil, uh, natural additives that would increase its water holding capacity. So it would reduce the need for irrigation, but also provide nutrients for the uh, for the plants. Great, awesome. That is what I can say. I myself have interacted with ICPA a lot and someone who is very interested in uh, uh, UAE's food security marketplace. Uh, I would also like to highlight here, uh, very recently I was interacting with uh, various stakeholders before and after G20's Minister for Agriculture and, and uh, some of the uh, viewpoints shared by the Minister of Food Security, Her Excellency Mariam, who are about collaboration. And I think ICBA is the best example how to collaborate globally. And some of the projects which I've been seeing for past few years of ICBA, which includes multiple stakeholders from across the region and use peer leading the partnership effort of ICBA 
congratulations for the great work you have been doing. Uh, Sita, this brings us to something which is closer to your organization. Uh, ICBA is a very, very extrovert organization, doing a lot of events, conferences, stakeholder meetings, and suddenly you are having COVID where everybody has to work remotely, locked down in their houses. How ICBA is coping up with uh, such scenario, as well as the same time, as an individual, Seta, who has been uh, traveling, meeting people so much, uh, you are also asked to like you know work remotely, not meeting so many people, and then you have a very important uh, month of Ramadan Kareem going on. Uh, personal level also, it's a very very stressful for you and your employees. Uh, can you guide me about how you are coping up with these personal and organizational challenges? Okay, so we have like switched to working mostly virtually. Uh, now, as you know, you've been to ICBA. We do have a big farm. Uh, our work involves actually a lot of field work. And uh, the COVID-19 situation uh, came to the UAE where we're headquartered in early March. So this is for us the harvesting time. So it's a bit challenging to find mechanisms and ways to uh, to adapt to this work, but I have to say that uh, we've been lucky that we're here because we've had very clear guidance and instructions by the government. They have facilitated the work. Uh, they are always uh, up updating the uh, the people on what can and cannot be done. They were. Uh, systems instituted online where you can get permits to go to work to come back. So this has facilitated our work uh, immensely. But as everyone else, we've also discovered the amount of work that we can also achieve online and using the facility of course, such as Zoom today, where we've used other also Microsoft Teams, uh, other platforms, uh, and it does add to connectivity. There are other ways to do work at least part of the work and the outreach that we've been doing before and like everyone else we're learning we're learning how to be more vigilant how to be more resilient how to be more efficient how to be more effective and uh, from someone who really uh, holds dear that we need to do everything within our power for to reduce our carbon footprints for climate change mitigation I'm really optimistic that from this situation, as humanity and as businesses, we'd learn how to uh, utilize the internet more, how to utilize virtual more, uh, work more to improve the environment and uh, hopefully work towards the Paris Agreement uh, declaration in terms of reducing our footprint. That's great to know organization like yours and a lot of other organizations, they've started enjoying the virtual way of doing things. And that's good for our business also, being someone who is in digitization of agriculture ecosystem. It's a great opportunity for us. And you'll be surprised for a lot of people, COVID as a business is a challenge. Uh, we have been approached by World Bank, IFC. We got a project from UNDP, a lot of speak country, federal governments of Africa are talking to us to digitize their farmer information. And we'll look forward to start the, the project we plan with ICBA soon as well. Uh, so that, that brings me to the last section of this discussion uh, with someone with such a body of work and experience. Uh, we are looking for some very basic uh, advice for those startups and entrepreneurs who are interested in working in uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa, specifically in food and agriculture sector. So what would be your silver bullets for them so that uh, they can add value to themselves as in businesses as well as to the society at large? So what would be those silver bullets from you? So, uh, you know, with the, with the COVID-19 and with the COVID-19 uh, this year, we've also had simultaneously the locust problem in Africa. And this is on top of the uh, climate change and biodiversity loss challenges that food security and food production was facing before. So combined, these have basically brought food supply and food security higher up on the agenda. Uh, so uh, I believe that we would see a higher emphasis 
on the food sector in the uh, coming months and years. And it is my expectation is that this is, will be one of the sectors that would be re revitalized in many countries. And of course, we cannot survive without food, so we would have to come up with solutions. And, uh, but we have the biophysical constraints that are very real, which is the uh, limitation and scarcity of water resources, the uh, poor soil conditions, the harsh environments, and uh, high tech and digital tools that are coming uh, can do a lot in terms of breaking down those challenges or increasing efficiencies uh, like we've seen from remote sensing by linking weather data to actual what is happening at the root zone of crops and based on that applying the needed requirement for the crop of, uh, in terms of water and how much we can decrease the water usage while increasing also productivity by giving the right amount of water together with the right amount of fertilizer and so forth. So I, I can see a very big role for digital and uh, high-tech technologies coming in the future in this region. And it's a, it's a range. When we say high-tech, that doesn't mean high, high and expensive tech, but it is high-tech in terms of what has not been used before in the agricultural sector. And hopefully, with, with this, we would also see a trend that we've seen in the past few years of what, whereby the youth are not engaged in agriculture anymore. And they're migrating to cities, to other uh, works. So I would uh, hope to see, and I would expect to see more agripreneurship growing up. And this is a role where these uh, food tech and agricultural tech uh, startups uh, have a big role in my opinion. And as ICBA, you mentioned in terms of areas to collaborate with ICBA, we have basically one of our major modalities of how we do work is through partnership. We're relatively a small organization. We have between 65 and 70 people or employees and scientists working uh, with us, whereby we focus on the innovations. But then on getting those innovations to the field, getting them uh, to scale, this is where we partner. We partner with governments, but we're increasingly partnering with the private sector, with small businesses, uh, SMEs in the countries to see how we can upscale those innovation and how we can improve them and adapt them even further at the country level and field level. Well, that's, that's great. And uh, I strongly believe that uh, Partnership and collaborations are the way forward. And I also would like to like stress upon one very important thing you said, high tech doesn't mean high cost. So there are solutions, for example, our farmers now they're using WhatsApp call to connect with their buyers where they can see the cost, show the quality of their produce. <laughs> no cost solution, but yes, high tech. So as you rightly mentioned that we have to start seeing the value. Technology is just not about making money from the farmers and the ecosystem. It's about delivering value. Uh, thanks a lot, Sita, for your time. It was really very, very insightful and uh, very, very, I'll say that, uh, uh, knowledgeable discussion. I learned a lot from it, and I'm very sure the audience would also learn a lot from it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Deepak. Thank you for hosting me, and it was an, uh, an interesting discussion. Thank you. God bless. Take care. Bye.